Welcome to CryoTalk, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Featuring conversations between your host, Ava Amson, and experts in the field of cryo-electron microscopy. Today on CryoTalk. Today on CryoTalk, we are joined by Rhys Grinter, lab head in the Department of Microbiology at Monash University. He talks about how he determined the structure of an enzyme that turns air into electricity. Yes, there's about half a part per million hydrogen um, in the air. And bacteria use it as an auxiliary energy source when they're starved, when they have nothing else to live on. And how cryo-EM helped reveal the details of this protein. But it also told us the mechanism that the enzyme's using to take the electrons, take the energy from hydrogen and then direct them to the bacterial membrane into what they call the electron transport chain that allows the bacteria to make ATP. He also shared some of his favourite places he discovered while travelling, including Shark Bay. The whole thing's a World Heritage Area and it's, it's this place where the, the red desert of inland Australia meets like tropical sea, right? So you've got mm-hmm. big seagrass meadows and dugongs and um, coral reefs and, and it's an incredibly special place. All in this episode of CryoTalk. Hi and welcome to CryoTalk. I'm Eva Amson and I'm here today with Rhys Grinter. Rhys is lab head in the Department of Microbiology at Monash University in Australia. So hi Rhys, how are you today? Yeah, good. Yourself? I'm good. Thanks for joining us. Um, so we usually start off with um, a little bit of background. So why don't you share a bit of your career path? How did you get to where you are? Yeah, sure. I guess it's maybe a bit more convoluted than some people. I <laughs> did high school on an island called Kangaroo Island in South Australia in Australia and then went to Adelaide, which is the state, the capital of South Australia for undergraduate. Um, but then I sort of took a break between honours and PhD. We do honours in Australia first and then we do PhD. And, and I lived in Japan for a year and then I travelled for a couple of years and ended up in Scotland, Glasgow of all places, where I started a PhD in uh, microbiology. And then the lab next door to me was doing structural biology. So I got into X-ray crystallography. I followed that through um, after I finished my PhD. 2015, I returned to Melbourne and I've been at Monash University ever since. Ooh. Well, we're definitely going to be talking a bit more about your your break, your little research break, um, later on in the in the episode. Um, but when I was doing my background research on you, I came across this intriguing headline from earlier this year: "Scientists discover enzyme that turns air into electricity." Can you tell us a bit about that? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So this is a bit of a wild ride earlier in the year. So this is a project I've been working on myself and Professor Chris Greeny, who's also at Monash University, um, working on for maybe four or five years. And 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 Chris kind of discovered over the past decade that bacteria that live in, in soils, they utilize the, the small amount of hydrogen in the air. So there's about half a part per million hydrogen um, in the air. And bacteria use it as a auxiliary energy source when they're starved, when they have nothing else to live on. And we really wanted to isolate the enzyme and, and sort of figure out how it works. And so we worked, it took us about four or five years, but we managed to isolate mm-hmm. it, purify it, and use cryo-electron microscopy to determine the structure. And basically to show using enzyme assays and structural biology that, yeah, this enzyme is, is capable of, of taking th- that amount of hydrogen, half a part per million, a million, sorry, and, and converting it into electricity. Wow. And what, what could that knowledge be used for? <laughs> Well, we're hoping to further develop the enzyme to start thinking about making um, fuel cells and devices that can use electricity either in, in trace amounts because of the trace levels of hydrogen that are present in the air or in larger amounts to, to power kind of, you know, green electrical devices. Well, that would be cool. <laughs> and, well, it would and be very yeah. cool. <laughs> so you used cryoEM for this, as you mentioned. Um, why? What was the advantage of cryoEM? Yeah, it's a really good question. So, I mean, I guess I started out doing crystallography and that's that's what I learned. And, and for a long time, that was what I was doing. But this this um, enzyme that we're working on, is, it's very large, um, 800 kilodons in total. And it's it attaches to the membrane um, and it also has a solid flexibility. And we also can't make very much of it. So it was just, a, it's a structural target that would be completely inaccessible to, to crystallography. Um, but 
the advantages of modern cryo em allowed us to basically freeze grids and, and the first um grids that we collected gave us nice high -level resolution data so yeah it was a perfect technique for, for sort of studying the sample so what do you think um the cryo em structure revealed that you would not have been able to see otherwise yeah so, so i guess um we'd revealed the structure the, the, the structure of this enzyme complex that we wouldn't have been able to, to see by any other method. And, and this is an 800 kilodalton complex and, and it's also attached to the membrane and it's quite flexible. So it was not a target that would be accessible by, by cryo-EM, so by crystallography. And in fact, we couldn't make enough of the protein to do crystallography. So it revealed the structure, but also um, we had we had no idea what this, this structure looked like. So it consists of eight copies of one subunit, eight copies of another subunit, and four copies of a final subunit. We didn't know how they went together. And so it told us that, but it also told us the mechanism that the enzyme's using to take the electrons, take the energy from hydrogen and then direct them into the bacterial membrane, into a thing called the electron transport chain that allows the, the bacteria to make ATP. Oh, that sounds like a, it sounds like it was really complicated, like not even really knowing what you were looking for from the start. Yeah, no, exactly. And so we used we used a method I'm really a, a fan of for protein purification these days, which was just to chromosomally tag. So we put an affinity tag on one of the genes of the complex in the chromosome and then just pull it out from its host organism. So Mycobacterium smegmatis is the host organism. And so we ended up isolating it, another subunit we didn't know was part of the complex and got all this rich biological information that we wouldn't have got if we just made it more traditionally in the recombinant expression in the, in the coli. Yeah. That's cool. It's kind of like the, the more realistic situation that if you just looked at one subunit, then yeah. Exactly, um, exactly. And, and I think this is a, you know, this is a real power of, of cryo-EM and you see more and more people successfully applying cryo-EM tomography. So looking at molecules in whole cells. And so then you're getting the full context, context. And I think this is really where structural biology has got to go and where it's going. And it gives us a much more realistic picture of what's going on. Yeah. It kind of brings me to my next question, which is, um, what was it that initially drew you to cryo-EM? Like, do you remember when you first learned about the technique? Yeah, I do actually. So this was 2013 and I was getting pretty close to finishing my um, PhD in, in the UK. And, and there's, I think it was a, um, CCP4 is an initiative that has made a lot of crystallography software. And they have a, a meeting every year where people go to and they discuss the latest methods. And there was a talk where I think someone had done like a 3.5 angstrom resolution structure of like a ribosome by cryo-EM. And that was the first time I'd seen anything remotely that resolution that had been done by the technique. And so when I saw that, I was like, wow, I mean, this is, it kind of blew me away. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, you know, everyone was saying, oh, it's only going to be for big stuff. It's only going to be for, you know, a certain kind of targets. Mm -hmm. And so I was watching it since then. And then over the next decade, I guess, because that's where we are now, it's just got more and more and more advanced. And for quite a while, crystallography was still a better tool for, for mm -hmm. my research, but um, Monash University established its electron microscopy facility, I think about um, shortly after I arrived, about six or so years ago. And a lot of my colleagues were doing really cool experiments, producing really good data. And so we just sort of started doing broken parallel. And over time, cryo-EM has just sort of, it's been an easier route and a, and a a route that's allowed us to access a lot more complicated samples. Yeah. And and do you think um, over the past decade, it's become more accessible? I mean, I guess with people building new facilities, it must be, right? Yeah, absolutely. And initially in Australia, Monash had the first one that was the only one. So initially getting access to the instruments was was quite yeah. difficult because there's a lot of demand. But um, there's, there's at least two um, facilities in, in Melbourne now and many other facilities around the country, which I think alleviate that. The collection um, has got a lot faster. People have got a lot more skilled at dealing with the manipulating samples. And also the software is, you, you know, very easy to use nowadays. So the, the barrier for, for accessing and processing your data once you get it is lower now as well. So I think it's really maturing as a technique. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, we, we're now at the end of season two of this podcast. And so from all the, the stories that I've heard over the past couple of months, it really sounds like you know, things are really picking up and people are using it so much more often and for so many different things. It's, it's really interesting to hear. Yeah, um, we, we did yeah. a, oh, sorry. 
we, we did a, um, a road test recently where we had a 75 kilo dot membrane protein that I wanted to crystallize with a ligand or get the structure of the a ligand. And I'd already done a, a non-ligand structure by crystallography a few years ago. And so we, we did them side by side in the lab and we didn't manage to get a structure by crystallography, but the first grids we sold, we got a 2.3 enzyme structure by Pro-EM with the ligand bound. Um, wow. And so it's just, it was, it, it, it was the best technique. We were trying them side by side and it was the, the best technique for the job. So that was, it was really impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we just talked a bit about, you know, your work from a few months ago and years ago, but what are you working on at the moment? What's new? <laughs> Yeah, so I guess we're working on a few things. I feel like I've kind of, I've sort of stamp collected and, and then not wanted to drop exciting projects. So the, the lab's <laughs> major thing is, so we're, we're microbiologists, we're bacteriologists, and, and we use structural biology and, and biochemistry to sort of look at interesting systems mm -hmm. and, and answer interesting questions. So for example, the hydrogenase is these enzymes that are able to oxidize hydrogen from the air is, is, is one branch of what we do. And another um, a major interest is looking at uh, membrane transporters in bacteria, especially pathogenic bacteria, that they use to get iron and heme, so iron sources from the host during infection. So we're studying the structural biology and functional biology of those, how they interact with uh, proteins like hemoglobin, and how we could potentially inhibit them to prevent bacteria from getting essential nutrients. So, so that's one other theme. And the, the major other thing we're working on is um, looking at novel protein antibiotics um, to serve as alternatives to our dwindling supply of traditional antibiotics. And so we've got a project where we're looking at a class of protein that antibiotics that inhibit. Um, there's a really nice uh, multi-protein complex in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria called the BAM complex. And so we, we, we think that these antibiotics bind to and inhibit that BAM complex. So we want to figure out how that works, uh, both to develop these compounds, these proteins specifically, but also as a proof of principle for inhibiting this complex of antibiotic target. And, and this project is it's getting off the ground, but it's going to feature Crowium quite heavily to do mm -hmm. this massive multi-protein membrane complex with the inhibitor bound. And so we're really yeah. excited about that. Yeah, yeah. I was just about to ask, are you still using Crowium for that? But yeah, of course you are. <laughs> um, so you mentioned it at the beginning, but you took a little bit of a break um, between undergraduate and PhD, and it sounded really interesting. And do you want to tell us a bit more about what you did in that time and why you came back yeah, to sure. science? <laughs> I think I think I always knew I wanted to come back to science. I'd finished my honours and, and I'd been on Kangaroo Island, which is a small island, has about 5,000 people population. And I went to Adelaide, which has about a million people. So it was a much bigger city, mm -hmm. but I'd finished my honours and I probably could have stayed in Adelaide to do a PhD, but I uh, I felt there was a big wide world out there and I didn't want to just get stuck in this track. So I elected to kind of pause science for a while. And the Japanese government, I think they still have it, but there was a program called the JET program. It basically takes you on a government program and places you inside a, a school, a high school or a junior high school in Japan. So I applied for that program, got on that program and, and got sent to Sapporo, um, which is the capital of, of Hokkaido in Northern Japan. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was just like a new world for me. Like I think I'd been overseas once at that stage and, different culture, different people, different place, language, and just mm -hmm. really had a blast of a year. Um, the snow up there is amazing. So snowboarding every weekend and, and not focusing on job, but just focusing on kind of the experience and the life. Yeah. And um, did you know Japanese before you went? No, I didn't know a word of Japanese before <laughs> I went. And it was easier because I was in a city, um, but yeah. I still, I, I took, I think I took four or five hours of lessons a week. And so I was like solid intermediate by the time I left, but Sadly, it's all kind of slipped away subsequently. <laughs> yeah, and, and I guess, did you did you learn anything from your break that has been helpful in your science career after that? I think so, yeah. So just to summarise briefly, so after Japan, I went to northwestern Australia and mm. lived in a place called Shark Bay for two years. Um, animal theme names are apparently a thing that I like to do. Uh, it was like a solar salt mine. So it was a mine that makes salt from the sea. So I worked there as a chemist for a couple of years um, and then traveled from Australia. Well, I actually, I took a plane from Australia to Bali, but then I traveled from Bali to Scotland without flying. So oh, wow. went all through uh, Southeast Asia and then ended up going across into China and across through Kazakhstan, across the Caspian Sea and then through into Europe. And I mean, I think that's really taught me about 
I don't know, different people and different cultures and, and how kind of the world meshes together. And mm-hmm. I mean, how science is a fantastic career because it's completely transferable to many, many countries, right? Mm-hmm. So like I could say I could see myself living in multiple places, but this was, would be an option I would have if I pursued a career in science. Yeah. But yeah, and then you decided you wanted to do your PhD. Um, what what was kind of, how did you know that your break was over? I think there was a few things. So there was a point, because I was a process chemist in Western Australia, mm-hmm. and there was a point where like, I should have been doing the process chemistry, but there was like this really interesting side project where we were looking at the composition of highly concentrated brines. And I really wanted to do the experimental side of it more than the operational side of it. And so I think that was the point where I was like, well, I have to go back and do a PhD at a certain point. Yeah. And then when I arrived in Glasgow, it was 2009, 2010. So it was the middle of the global financial crisis. <laughs> and so there wasn't really any other jobs anyway, to, to be you know, honest about it. And so I thought it was a great time to do the PhD I'd always wanted to do. And, and so I applied for some programs at the University of Glasgow and was lucky enough to get a, get a scholarship and, and things went from there. Mm, yeah, no, I, I finished my PhD in 2008. So yeah, I know what you mean about there not being a, any jobs around that time. Like, yep. You just take what you That's can get, rough. you do what you can do. <laughs> um, yeah, so a, a question that I actually ask a lot of people is if do you have any favorite places that you've traveled to? So you've, you've been in a lot of countries, especially with the overland journey from Bali to Scotland. So any favorite places that you've come across along the way? I think so many, to be honest with you. It's really, it's really quite hard to pick. So um, Kangaroo Island, where I grew up, is it's it's fairly dry and sometimes got quite a Mediterranean climate, but the coast beautiful sandy beaches, mm. surfing, great fishing, really good diving, actually. So this is still a place that I consider really special. Um, Shark Bay, where I was living, it's a whole thing's a World Heritage Area, and it's, it's this place where the, the red desert of inland Australia meets, like, tropical sea, right? So you've mm-hmm. got big seagrass meadows and dugongs and um, coral reefs, and, and it's an incredibly special place. I was just back there um, a few weeks ago, actually, went up for, for a fishing trip snowboarding in Japan, um, the highlands of Scotland, like Tuscany and Italy, Istanbul. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's impossible to, to, to pick just <laughs> And they're all so I mean, different. I just, <laughs> I just think the world's kind of a, you know, fantastically interesting place, right? Like, yeah. Um, I've got a few quick fire questions for you. Do you have a favorite book that you could recommend to people? It's a good question. Um, I think if if I had to say, you know, one piece of literature that I, I would recommend, I would say 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's just really a beautiful piece of literature that could capture so much of humanity. And I'm, I'm reading less literature these days. I should get back into it. So that would be that would be a book I would definitely recommend. And, and what about um, films or TV shows? Do you have any favorite screen things that you can recommend? Yeah, yeah. So I've I've been kind of I've been watching less TV shows and cinema lately, um, but still getting into a few things. But I was recently in the United States. I went across to to California and I watched the entire series of Chernobyl from start to finish on the oh, plane, and it, I, I was just blown that. away. It, it was yeah. I mean it was a captive audience, and it's it's a tough I mean it's a tough watch, right? Like it's really, but. Yeah. I had the time to appreciate it and it was it was just this really slow burn. I got to the end of it and my, my wife's from 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 Eastern Europe, from Serbia, and, and I thought they captured something about the culture and the people so well and but just laid out this whole story. And so I would really recommend um, that as a yeah, series. And, yeah. I still need to finish it. Um I started it during the pandemic and it was just a bit too much. There was just there was a whole global pandemic going on and I'm watching this thing about Chernobyl and I was like, I just can't deal with this right now. But yeah, I should pick it up. Yeah, again. I started I started I think I started Man in the High Castle in the pandemic and then I was like, Yeah. And do you like listening to music? Yeah, yeah, I listen to a fair bit of music, and, and these days it's pretty eclectic. In my, in my younger years, I, I guess I was kind of a bit of a music snob. I listened to a lot of like indie rock, and I was like, oh, you, can listen, you can't listen to this, but you can listen to that. And, um, <laughs> but in more recent times, I've become completely agnostic, and like anything that, that sounds good, 
um, so yeah, a lot of 80s, a lot of 90s, a lot of, um, yeah, still kind of alternative kind of indie rock, like stuff like Neutral Milk Hotel and The Decemberists mm. and um, The Shims and, and things like that. But also my daughter's five and she really likes, you know, Katy Perry and she's getting mm-hmm. into Elton John. So I kind of follow along and I, I kind of, I don't regret, but I think it was a, it was a poor decision on my earlier self's part to be exclusionist about what music was good to listen to. And mm-hmm. if it makes you happy, then, then you should listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fun to explore lots of different types of music. Um, I mean, we already talked a little bit about science versus other things but another of my quick fire questions is if you were not a scientist what would you be oh no do i have to get paid to do it (laughs) it's just an imaginary career a man of leisure a traveling adventure (laughs) now um so a few things i could i could see myself doing I, i i think i could i could probably cook for a living I really enjoy cooking so and there's a certain kind of parallel i think to being in the kitchen and having that mm. organization and um and being a scientist or, or i think we we're discussing it the other day and i think being a chef would be so much higher pressure it's like if an experiment fails oh, in the yeah. lab it doesn't matter you just do it again if cooking if it isn't right and the meal goes out this bad then you know there's, there's real world consequences so yeah that would be high pressure yeah it's real people um, eating your food <laughs> but aside from yeah. that i mean i, th- I think i might have enjoyed being an engineer like it's nice being a scientist but one thing that you know you're you're discovering new knowledge but whether or not that new knowledge is translated is sometimes not up to you Mm. and so maybe being at the other end of it where you're like you're taking established knowledge but you're trying to make something or maintain something that keeps society running i think i could be quite satisfied doing that Mm. yeah and you and you mentioned you like cooking do you have any favorite recipes any favorite things you like to make my wife kind of ribs me because I don't like to repeat cooking things too too much, right? Mm. So it's like it's everything's on a three monthly rotation. But so mm. tonight I um I put a, a lamb shoulder on this morning and slow cooked it all day at 120 degrees. And so basically you put it on a bed of onions and then it just kind of mm. cooks down to tenderness. And then you take that and put it in um, tortillas with some Greek salad and, and some salsas and this is delicious. I think this is it, for the for the amount of effort it takes to cook. I think it's it's a winner for me. Yeah, it takes a long time. You need to plan. You can't just decide last minute. And... <laughs> um, and then the the last question is always a a, a difficult one for it maybe or an interesting one. Is there any piece of advice that you've received during your career or anything that you would want to pass on to scientists who are just starting out? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to be, you have to be really interested and passionate about what you're doing. And I think this was something people on other podcasts said, but mm. you, you, you want to wake up in the morning thinking about something and wanting to do something, not because you have to, because you want to. And and then once you have that, that, that isn't enough. Um, you want to pick a good lab and pick a good project and then inevitably you're going to get failure after failure you're going to have your grants rejected you're going to have your papers rejected and it's going to really make you feel like this path is quite difficult but if you have the intelligence and the passion and the perseverance then there's a good chance you'll still get to where you get to so try not to let any individual setback um get you get you down too much Mm -hmm good advice um so thank you reese thanks so much it was really good catching up with you in today's podcast and that brings us to the end of our episode today so thank you everyone for listening to or watching cryotalk